friends, this morning I spoke of death as an enemy that is also a friend. And now I want to speak about death as a separation that is in reality no separation. I want to speak, that is to say, about our continuing union in prayer and love with the dead. And let me begin by quoting a passage from a Russian missionary in Central Asia, Archimandrite Makari Glukarev. And this is a letter he wrote to someone who had been recently bereaved. God, in his love, separates us from one another temporarily in order once more to unite us all in Christ for eternity. Let us keep silent and devoutly reverence this love which surrounds us on every side. In Christ we live and move and have our being. I'm sorry, there's something wrong with the loudspeaker system. It's booming. Can you correct that? Yes, better. I'll start again. God, in his love, separates us from one another temporarily in order once more to unite us all in Christ for eternity. Let us keep silent and devoutly reverence this love which surrounds us on every side. In Christ, we live and move and have our being. Whether alive or dead, we are all in him. It would be more true to say, we are all alive in him, for in him there is no death. Our God is not a God of the dead, but of the living. He is your God. He is the God of her who has died. There is only one God. And in that one God, you are both united. Only you cannot see each other for the time being. But this means that your future meeting will be all the more joyful. And then no one will take your joy from you. Yet even now you live together. All that has happened is that she has gone into another room and closed the door. Spiritual love is not conscious of visible separation. Now, in that passage, I ask you to note first the way Father Macari speaks of the need for reticence for reverence, for silence. Let us keep silent, he says, and devoutly reverence this love which surrounds us. Death, like birth, is a miracle and a mystery. It is unwise to try and say too much. Christ in the Gospels affirms the coming resurrection of all humanity at the last day. But our Savior tells us very little about our situation immediately after death. The future life, so it has been said, is an unknown world with a well-known inhabitant. But of one thing we may be firmly assured. 
despite the outward separation of death, the inner bond of love remains. Our communion with each other still continues. As Father McCary says, even now you live together. And then he uses a very vivid illustration. All that has happened is that she has gone into another room and closed the door. When someone we love dies, our relationship is changed, but not destroyed. As we mourn, what the dead person says to us is this. Weep, but do not despair. I am I, and you are you. Whatever we were previously to each other, that we still are now. I have only slipped away into the next room, but I am still close. For the time being, the door is closed, but in God's time, it will be opened again. You will pass through the door also into the next room. We shall meet again. And that meeting will be joyful beyond all our present imagining. That is what the dead person says to us. And what is the basis for this sense of continuing communion? Is it wishful thinking? Is it sentimental, subjective? No. It possesses a firm foundation. It rests not on feeling, but on fact. It rests on the fact of Christ's own resurrection. Because Christ is risen from the dead, death, is no longer an unbridgeable chasm. As Father Macari says, we are all alive in him, for in him there is no death. In the risen Christ, death is abolished, there is only life. In the risen Christ, separation is overcome. There is only union in love. As the Paschal homily says at Easter midnight, Christ is risen and life reigns in freedom. So my theme at this, the second of my three talks, is how is this communion in love maintained. How is it that we can preserve our closeness with the departed? Let me mention quickly a false turning, attractive to some, but fiercely rejected by the church. We do not maintain our union with the departed through spiritualism and necromancy. We do not maintain it through Ouija boards and mediums. This may put us in touch with the demonic spirits of evil, but it certainly doesn't bring us close to our loved ones. Spiritualism is illegitimate curiosity. It's rather undignified, like peeping through the keyhole when we find the door is closed. <laughs> As Father Alexander Yelchaninov says in his diary of a Russian priest, we must humbly admit the existence of a mystery and not try to slip round by the back doors, back stairs to eavesdrop. In the Bible, in the lives of the saints, there are some occasions when the dead communicate with the living through dreams. 
But we on our side must not force such contact. Any attempt to manipulate the dead is abhorrent. So, if our contact is not through spiritualism, then how is it maintained? Through mutual prayer. Our meeting place with the dead is not the seance parlor, but the Eucharistic table and the icon corner in our own home. The only legitimate basis for fellowship with the dead is communion in prayer, especially at the Divine Liturgy, but also in our own personal prayer times. Why pray for the dead? The first answer is, because it helps them. Of this we may certainly be confident. Some people say, if the dead are in a better place, then now why pray for them? But they still need our prayers. We don't understand how our prayers help them but we are assured by tradition that they do. Intercessory prayer, in any case, is always a mystery. When we pray for a living person, we can't explain how the intercession helps them, but it's a fact of experience, attested by countless thousands, that to be prayed for at a time of crisis when we are ill or lonely, in danger, or faced by some critical decision, to know that we are being prayed for is a reassurance, a support, a source of strength. Intercession, we might say, is focusing the love of God where it is needed. Or if you like, it's holding a person up in the stream of God's love. We do that for the living. We know that it helps them. We may be assured that prayer for the dead is no less effective. But I would give a second reason. We pray for the dead because we love them. We pray for them because they and we are united in love. And since we love them, we cannot help praying for them. Prayer and love go together. Not to pray for the dead would be so cold an attitude, so contrary to love, that it cannot be right. Should a man who all through his married life for 50 years has prayed daily for his wife suddenly stop praying for her because she has died? Surely not. Prayer for the dead, and this is a phrase I take from a great Anglican William Temple, prayer for the dead is the ministry of love. We do not pray for the dead because otherwise God would neglect them. No, we pray because we know he loves them and we claim the right to join our love with his. So prayer for the dead is simply the spontaneous expression of our love. Have our departed loved ones ceased to exist that we should cease to pray for them. We are members still of one family, and so we continue unbroken in our prayer. For whom do we pray? The first answer that springs to mind is, not for the saints in heaven, 
not for the condemned in hell, but for those in what is termed the middle state, those who have departed this life in the faith of Christ and in the communion of the church, but who have not been glorified by name through an official church decision. That answer is true, but perhaps we need to go further. Perhaps it is more true to say, we pray for all. Even sometimes we pray for the saints in heaven. That happens in the divine liturgy. Immediately after the Epiclesis, in the liturgy of St. John Chrysostom, we say, also we offer you this spiritual worship for those who have gone to their rest in faith, forefathers, fathers, ascetics, preachers, and every righteous spirit made perfect in faith, above all for our most holy, pure, blessed, and glorious lady, the Theotokos and ever Virgin Mary. The text in the liturgy of St. Basil differs here. Now that looks to me very like a prayer for the saints. We are offering the holy liturgy for the saints. It's true that St. Nicholas Cavasilas in his commentary on the Divine Liturgy, it says it's not a prayer for the saints, it's just thanksgiving on their account. But on the plain reading of the text, it does seem that we are offering Christ's sacrifice for those in glory. However, I leave that on one side. What is much more clear is this, that sometimes we pray even for those in hell. We do that particularly on the Kneeling Vespers Pentecost Sunday in the third prayer. On this final and saving festival, we say, Thou art pleased to accept intercessory propitiation for those imprisoned in hell, affording us great hopes that thou wilt send down relaxation and refreshment to all held in bondage. It's true there we don't pray outright for them to be released from hell, but we do pray for relaxation and refreshment. St. John of Damascus, however, goes further in his work on those who die in the faith. He tells the story of Pope Gregory the Great and the Emperor Trajan. The Emperor Trajan was remembered as the outstanding example of a pagan emperor who had been a righteous ruler. And Pope Gregory the Great, so we are told, was troubled by the fact that Trajan had died outside the Christian faith, and therefore Pope Gregory feared he might be in hell. And he prayed for the emperor Trajan until finally the emperor appeared to Gregory in a dream and said to the pope, yes, I was in hell, but because of your prayers, I have been released and I am there no longer. So up to the second coming, up to the last judgment, the gates of hell are not finally closed. According to St. John of Damascus, anyone who has just a little leaven of virtue, 
even the tiniest spark of goodness, even though in this life he's failed to bring it to full realization, will not be rejected by God in his mercy. So, we pray for all. Publicly, in the services of the church, we pray for those who have died in the communion of the church. We do not celebrate memorial services for the unbaptized. But privately, we may pray for those who have never been baptized, who have never come to a conscious knowledge of Christ. We believe that the love of God is far greater than our love. Everyone will be judged by the question whether they lived this life by the best that they knew. Those in the church will be judged by the rules of the church. Those outside the law, says St. Paul, will be judged by the rules that apply outside the law. We commend everyone to God's mercy. We pray for all. But it is said, what is the scriptural basis for prayer for the dead? First of all, did Jesus pray for the dead? We are told that he would always go off to some place where he could be alone and pray. But we aren't told for whom and exactly how he prayed. We do know that in his time there was a disagreement between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The Sadducees said there was no resurrection from the dead. The Pharisees affirmed a resurrection. Jesus sided on this question with the Pharisees. Also, we know that in the Old Testament, prayer for the dead was already established. The notable occasion is in the second book of Maccabees, chapter 12, verses 43 to 45. After a great battle, Judas Maccabeus took up a collection and he sent the money to Jerusalem so that it could be offered as a sin offering on behalf of the dead who had fallen in battle. And the text goes on to say that this was a very right thing to do, to pray for the dead. So there was prayer for the dead in Judaism before the time of Christ. So I think even though nothing is said explicitly, we have every reason to believe that Jesus himself prayed for the dead. In the New Testament, there is an enigmatic passage much emphasized by the Mormons. 1 Corinthians 15.29, where St. Paul says, what do people mean by being baptized on behalf of the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptized on their behalf? Now, it isn't exactly clear what St. Paul means by being baptized on behalf of the dead. Whatever the practice was, it didn't continue in the church. But it clearly suggests some kind of prayer for the dead. <coughs> we as Orthodox do not take scripture in isolation. But we always take account of the way Scripture has been lived and understood in the church. Holy tradition is nothing else than the living continuity of the church of our time with Scripture. 
And if we look at tradition, at living continuity, then we find that prayer for the dead appears very soon, certainly by the second century. In the Acts of Paul and Thecla, from the middle of the second century, we are told that Thecla prayed for the dead daughter of her hostess. May she live forever. In other words, may she inherit eternal life. And we have also from the second century an inscription, an epitaph, written for himself by Bishop Averchios of Hierapolis. There he describes himself as a disciple of the pure shepherd who feeds the flocks of his sheep upon the mountains and in the plains and who has great all-seeing eyes. And then he says at the end, pray for Averchios. Another early example is the, pa the passion story, the story of the death of Saint Perpetua. This is about the year 203. Perpetua's little brother, Dinocrates, had died of cancer, aged seven, unbaptized. As she was waiting to face martyrdom, she had a vision in which she saw him in torment, and she prayed for him. And then she saw a second vision in which he was released from all pain. Her intercession gained for him the grace and benefits of baptism. So there, from early tradition, we have clear evidence that we can pray for the unbaptized. Tertullian, in the early third century, speaks of offering the Holy Eucharist, the divine liturgy for the dead, especially on the anniversary of their death. We offer oblations for the dead on an annual day as for their birthdays. See there, the death day equals the birthday. And from Rome, in the different catacombs, we have many, many examples of prayers for the dead. Let me just give you a few examples. Dear Privata, may you dwell in refreshment and peace. Sometimes the living are joined with the dead. Claudius Philotas, to his dearest brother Theodore, May we live in God. There you have very clearly the solidarity between the living and the departed. In other inscriptions, a dead child is asked to pray for her parents. Pray for your parents, Matronata Matrona, who lived one year, 52 days. If any of you have lost children in infancy, you may be reassured at the thought that they are praying for you. Here's another example. Anatolius, our firstborn, ours for a little while, pray for us. Now, from this practice of praying for the dead, one conclusion of the utmost importance can be drawn. The dead remain conscious after death. They are in some way aware of us and our actions and especially of the fact that we are remembering them in prayer. It's true that there existed in the early church a group which claimed that between death and the final resurrection, souls were in a state simply of suspended animation. They were just sleeping. 
And of course we do talk about the dead as those who have fallen asleep. And we refer to their place of burial as a cemetery, a sleeping place. So one group took this language literally. They were called Thnitopsychite, dead solars. But this position was quickly repudiated by the church. It is already refuted by Justin the Martyr in the middle of the second century. And in fact in scripture we have clear evidence that the dead do retain consciousness and activity in the period between death and the second coming. There is for example the story of the rich man and Lazarus, Luke 16. Moses was present at the transfiguration. So was Elias, but Elias had not undergone death. He'd been taken up alive into heaven. But Moses had died, but he's there at the transfiguration, present and active. We are told in John 8.56 that Abraham rejoices to see the day of Christ. After the crucifixion, it said in St. Matthew's Gospel, Matthew 27.52, that the saints in Jerusalem rose from their tombs and went about the holy city. And in the book of Revelation, we have a clear description of the prayer offered by the departed. And this is in the period before the second coming. Chapters 4 and 5, we have that marvelous account of the 24 elders worshipping the Lamb. And in chapter 6, we are told that the souls of the martyrs cry out from beneath the altar, how long? This prayer for the departed signifies that there is consciousness, yes. But also, surely, if we pray for the departed, it means that there is the possibility of change and progress. The 16th century Protestant reformers forbade prayer for the dead because they said no change is possible after death. All is fixed, all is decided. So prayer for the dead is pointless. Our orthodox view is different. We emphasize two things. First, this present life is the time for decision, the keros. 2 Corinthians 6, 2. Behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. We are to think of St. German. From this day, from this hour, from this minute. Don't put things off. We cannot, after death, make a set of totally new choices unrelated to the choices that we made when alive. We cannot after death become totally different people from what we were on this earth. That is the first point. But then we have to add, when we die, in the case of most of us, there is much unfinished business. We are not ready for the immediate vision of death, for the full splendor of God's glory. We have to be healed, healed into divine love, and this happens gradually. We do not become totally different from what we were on earth, but there is a gradual clarification what we are already becomes, by degrees, clearer and clearer to ourselves. Our true self is revealed. And in this process, often long, difficult and painful, we are assisted 
by the intercessions of the living. So we are to affirm those two things. Now is the time of decision. But there is growth after death. The Orthodox Church speaks of this growth after death, what I have called the process of clarification particularly in its teaching about the toll houses, the telonia. And this applies to the period immediately after death. This teaching is quite ancient, the third century in Origen, the fourth century in Athanasius, and it's found in a developed form in the 10th century in the life of St. Basil the New, written by Gregory of Thrace. The teaching about the toll houses is this. They are said to be 22 in number. 22 custom houses, each concerned with a different kind of sin, gluttony, lust, jealousy, sloth, anger. And the soul goes from, after death, from one toll house to another, accompanied by the guardian angel. And at each custom house, the soul's luggage is unpacked and inspected by demonic customs officers. All kinds of things turn out to be in our luggage that we hadn't noticed and had forgotten about. Scrolls are produced, recording all our thoughts, words, and actions. But the guardian angel is there to ensure fair play. <laughs> now, I might say when I arrived in San Francisco yesterday, your customs officers weren't at all demonic. They didn't look inside my luggage at all. Now, what are we to make of this teaching about the toll houses? And there's been quite a bit of controversy about it in recent years in the Orthodox Church. It is not a dogma. But it is more than a mere legend or pious opinion. If we want to use the technical term, I would say it is a theologumenon, a theological view that has considerable support in tradition, in the fathers, in the lives of the saints, though it is not defined as a dogma. But we shouldn't take all this too literally. Life after death is not subject to space and time as we know them now. It's impossible for us to imagine exactly how things are going to be after death. That's why we have to be reticent. The toll houses are a way of expressing in picture language something that lies beyond our present comprehension. We shouldn't take the picture language over literally. But I do believe that in the symbolism of the toll houses there is a very important truth. There is progress after death. Progress in self-knowledge. Death is the moment of truth. The judgment, is, this is particularly emphasized in St. John's Gospel, the judgment is going on continually throughout our life. Every day, here and now, we are continually being judged by our reactions. But for most of the time, this continuing process of judgment is hidden from us. 
Our attention during life is all too often centered on inessentials. At death, the trivialities are stripped away. At death and afterwards, the true significance and direction of our life is revealed to us. For some, that will be a great joy. For others, it will be intense pain. We shall see our face and not like it. For many of us, it will be a mixture of the two. What Dante calls sweet wormwood. This self-discovery can happen not only after death, it can also happen in the weeks and months before death. Many people knowing that they are going to die for the first time come to terms with the sort of person that they really are. They've often been running away from that all their life. They don't like to look in the mirror and see their true face. But when you know you're going to die, you have to do that. As Madame Marie de Enitzel says, she's a psychologist and hospice campaigner who counseled President Mitterrand before his death. As people face death, they need to be true to themselves to drop masks. So that's the deeper meaning of the toll houses. Death and what follows it is self-knowledge, confrontation with the person that I really am. You might ask, how far does this orthodox teaching about the toll houses correspond to the Roman Catholic doctrine of purgatory? Well, there are certain evident differences. We Orthodox don't use the word purgatory. Many Roman Catholics talk about people being punished in purgatory by fire. And they appeal to 1 Corinthians 3.13. The fire shall try everyone's work. We Orthodox don't think that refers to the fire of purgatory, but to the fire of the last judgment. Some Roman Catholics, though not all, say that through their sufferings, the souls in purgatory are rendering satisfaction for their sins, that their sufferings have an atoning expiatory value. We Orthodox don't much like the word satisfaction. And we feel that this undermines the fullness of Christ's redemption on the cross. Through his sacrificial death, Christ has rendered complete expiation and satisfaction for our sins. We cannot possibly add to that. So there are differences here between orthodoxy and Rome. But we should not exaggerate them too much. Many Roman Catholics don't talk about expiation in purgatory. Many of them see purgatory not as a prison, but as a hospital. They would say purgatory is God's love healing us into freedom, a place where one is taught to love and to be loved. Not punishment, but growth into maturity, and the birth pangs of a new creation. That's the kind of approach we find in St. Catherine of Genoa in the 14th century, or in Cardinal Newman's poem, The Dream of Gerontius. And I think here we can say that when purgatory is understood in this way, it is not so very different from our orthodox understanding of growth in self-knowledge, of gradual purification after death, being healed into love.
on Oxford Station, when I'm going up to London, I often have to wait for the train. And so I walk to the far end of the railway platform. And coming at the far end, I find a notice saying, passengers must not proceed beyond this point. Penalty, 50 pounds. I think theologians and those who speak about the things of God need to set up a similar kind of notice. <laughs> Theologians must not proceed beyond this point, and you can invent your own penalty much better than I. There's a real danger of trying to say too much, and that applies especially when we're speaking of the state of the departed. Let us remember the words of St. Basil the Great. Sigi timastho ta arita. Let things ineffable be honored in silence. There are very many things about the state of the departed which from our situation in this present life we do not and we cannot clearly understand. But of one thing we are clearly confident. Christ is risen from the dead. In him there is no death, and in him we are all one. Death cannot break the communion of love. How is the bond of love upheld? Through mutual prayer. How do our prayers help the departed? We do not understand, but we are sure that they do help them. And because our communion in love with the dead continues unbroken, when we think or speak of the dead, we shouldn't use the past, but the present tense. That is very important. Don't say, we loved each other. She was so very dear to me. We were so happy together. No. What we should say is, we still love each other now more than ever before. She is as dear to me as ever. We are so happy together. Speak in the present tense. In our Orthodox parish in Oxford, there is a lady of determined character who lived on to her late 90s, recently died. After her husband had passed on before her, she objected very much to being called a widow. She said, I am his wife, not his widow. People still remain married after death. And they'll still be married in the age to come. Christ says in the age to come there is no marriage or giving in marriage. People do not marry there. But married people who were married in this life are still married people in the life to come. And this may help us with a specific problem that causes some people sharp anguish. What if we quarrel with someone and then they die unexpectedly and we haven't been reconciled? Are we to say too late? Dostoevsky says those words are written up in hell. Too late. Well, I'm not speaking of hell now but our situation in this world. No, it's not too late. If you quarreled and were not reconciled, I would say this to you. When you go home tonight and say your evening prayers, ask forgiveness from the person you wronged and who is now dead. Speak to them by name, and in your prayers, 
say to them the things you would have wanted to say if they were still alive. The knots can be untied. It's not too late to make a fresh start. How they are aware of what you say, we do not understand. But it is a fact of experience, and I can say this from a number of people whom I've counseled, that to ask forgiveness changes things after death as it is in life. Yes, indeed, but how much better to ask forgiveness from them before they die. One thing that mindfulness of death brings home to us is live with intensity in the present moment. Do not put things off. That's what the memory of death says to us. Act now. There's a story told of three demons who were completing their training in hell. And they appeared for their final examination, their final viva, before the chief demon, the demonic professor. And he turned to the first of the little demons and said, when you go up there on earth, what are you going to tell them? I shall tell them, the demon answered, there is no God. Hmm, said the examiner. They've been told that many times before. There's nothing new about saying that. The difficulty is too many of them know him personally. So he turned to the second demon and said, and what will you tell them? And the second replied, I shall tell them there is no hell. Ah, said the professor, that is more ingenious. But it is not really very convincing. Too many of them are living in hell already. <laughs> and so he turned to the third one and asked, and what will you tell them? And the third responded, I shall tell them there is no hurry. <laughs> Excellent, said the chief demon. Go up quickly and start work at once. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. I've got quite a few questions. I was pleased by what came up on one card, which said, you have answered all my questions, thank you. <laughs> that was comforting. And the next card that I got had nothing written on it. So I don't know what to answer to that. But I do remember the story told of the famous Roman Catholic preacher, Bosway, in the 17th century. He said to his theological students that they could put a slip of paper up into the pulpit with any text they liked, and he would go up into the pulpit not knowing what the text would be and would be prepared to preach a sermon extempore. So they tried putting up different texts, and always he had something to say. So eventually they just put up a sheet of blank paper. <laughs> and he picked it up and he looked at it. And he said, nothing, nothing. And out of this nothing, God created a universe. <laughs> And he was well away with his sermon. 
Now, here is a question. What did G, and I'm sorry, I don't have time to answer all your questions, but I, so forgive those who don't get their questions answered, please forgive me. What did Jesus mean when he said to one of his apostles about the death of the apostle to be his father and his burial, let the dead bury their own dead? I think we always have to look at quotations in scripture in their context. Sometimes things are said in a particular situation which wouldn't necessarily be general rules. In this case, Jesus calls somebody to his service. He calls them to the work of preaching. And Jesus insists that the fields are ready for the harvest and that preaching is urgent. It is important that we should bury our dead with reverence and love, that we should mourn for them and remember them. But we shouldn't do so in such a way that we forget the tasks which are waiting for us on earth. And I think that is the meaning of Christ's words there. Christ called that person to the work of the apostolate and the work could not wait. The needs of the living, the urgency of the gospel, the good news, took precedence. But that wouldn't apply always. And in general, it is right for us to mourn people, to bury them, to show them all respect. But at the same time, we have, having done our period of mourning, to continue with our life on earth. There are some people who remain so absorbed in their grief that they cut themselves off and do nothing further and simply live fixed in the past. And I'm sure that the departed do not want us to do that. They want us to get on with our lives here on earth, to be active, to be creative. And in that situation, the phrase, let the dead bury their dead, applies. We are to continue to remember the departed, but not in such a way that we overlook our own vocation, the things we have to get on with in this world. Then several people have raised again the question that I was asked after the first talk. What about people who go through a very bitter and painful death, not peaceful, not like falling asleep? I remember what was said to me by my own spiritual father, a Russian priest, when he was quite near to the end of his life. He said, I am not afraid of death, but dying can be very difficult. I think that's an important distinction. The process of dying can sometimes be very hard, but that does not alter the fact that what lies at the end, the actual death, is our birthday into fuller life. So we should not let the pain that precedes the death cause us to lose sight of the greater end that lies beyond. It's good to make a distinction between death and dying. Here's a question about the toll houses. 
If one's luggage is inspected, of what does that luggage consist? What is the relation of confession and repentance to one's luggage? The church teaches that if we have sincerely repented of our sin, and especially if we have confessed it in the sacrament of confession and received absolution, that sin is forgiven. So I do not think those sins would be produced by the demonic customs officers. But each of us should ask ourselves how full and how sincere has my repentance been? Can we really say it was complete? And then again, we can say, did I take the sacrament of confession with sufficient seriousness? And again, Absolution by itself is not enough. There has to be a change in our life. After I'd been to confession, well, was my life different? That might be in our luggage. And then again, it's true that in confession, all our sins are forgiven. The absolution prayers speak of sins voluntary and involuntary, known and unknown. But perhaps there has to be a confrontation with our unknown sins. Our problem so often is our insensitivity, our lack of vision. We do not see. Think of the gospel two Sundays ago, the Sunday of the Last Judgment, the sheep and the goats. The goats were surprised when the Savior said to them, I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. The goats were surprised. They said, when? They hadn't realized their sin was not deliberate malice, but lack of vision, lack of love. When we don't love, then we don't see. So perhaps at the toll houses, we are shown the opportunities that we missed, and we never realized we'd missed them. The times people were waiting for us, waiting with longing, for us to help them, to show them some affection, to take notice of them, and we didn't. We just walked by. Perhaps those are the kind of things that may be in our luggage. And another thing, even when we have confessed our sins, even when they are conscious sins, we often do not realize the consequences. We do not realize that through our sinfulness we have blighted and maimed other people's lives. We just go off and don't think more about it. And perhaps we have to be brought face to face with the consequences of the things we did, which we never realized in this life. And I'm sure those of us who are clergy have so often failed in our pastoral work. So we do have to face up to that. And I'm sure bishops have heavier luggage than most people. Now, I have various questions about for whom we can pray. What if our parents, grandparents, and so on were not Orthodox Christians? Does the Orthodox Church remember them in prayer? 
here there is a distinction to be made between those who are commemorated by name in the public services of the church and those for whom we pray in our own private prayers at home. If we follow the strict tradition of the Orthodox Church, then in public prayers we only pray for those who died in the communion of the Orthodox Church. That is the strict rule. But in fact, Many Orthodox parishes and clergy do apply economy here. They do say if people belong to other churches, not Orthodox, and died in the faith of Christ and in his resurrection, we may include them in the prayers said at the prothesis, at the preparation before the liturgy. Certainly I am willing to serve memorial services for people who are not Orthodox, when their relatives were orthodox, if these people died in the faith. That is a relaxation of the strict rule, but I think it is a perfectly correct use of economy. But in our private prayers, we may pray for everyone. When the Russian writer Tolstoy died, he died excommunicated by the church. He had had an unhappy relationship with the Russian Orthodox Church authorities. He had attacked them in some of his writings, and the Holy Synod had excommunicated him. Actually, at the time of his death, he was trying to travel to the monastery of Optina, and certainly he hoped, I think, to be reconciled. Unfortunately, he fell ill before he could get there, and when the starets from Optina came to hear his confession and give him absolution, Tolstoy's wife would not admit him. So Tolstoy died excommunicate. His sister was a nun. In those days, the Russian church applied the rules strictly, there was no memorial service for him, no panikida, and that grieved his sister deeply that she could not pray for her brother, who had died in the faith of Christ, even though he had his own personal opinions. And so she wrote to one of the leading bishops of the time and said that it was a scandal to her that she was not allowed to pray for her brother. And the bishop replied, by the rules of the church, we cannot have a public service for him. But you can pray for him, you should pray for him, you must pray for him every day in your own prayers. So there is that distinction made. But as I say, in very many places, economy is applied. My own spiritual father was a priest of the, one of the strictest Russian Orthodox groups, the Russian church abroad, the synodal church. But he taught me as priest to remember everybody at the preparation before the liturgy. He said, you may commemorate the names of whom you wish. Christ died for everyone. And so he applied economy and I'm happy to do so too. Can I ask departed loved ones who were not believers to pray for me? Yes, in your personal prayers. They may not have believed in this life, but perhaps if they lived by the best that they knew in this life, they have met Christ after death. And perhaps they have recognized him as expressing all that they cared about most deeply. Perhaps they now are believers. So I think you may ask them in your private prayers to pray for you.
the saints wait for a judgment or are they already in heaven? The Roman Catholic view is that after death there is a particular judgment and the saints enter into the full glory of heaven. The Orthodox view is that the saints are already in heaven. They are already in glory. But they are not yet in the fullness of glory. The fullness will only come after the resurrection, after the second coming. And as I say, the orthodox teaching also is that until the second coming, we cannot say that anyone is definitively and irrevocably in hell. When a Jewish person dies, what happens? I once heard that they were given the chance to accept Christ. What do you know about this? I know very little about it. <laughs> I remember the notice at the end of the railway station platform. <laughs> but I certainly believe that Jews who live by the best in the tradition of Judaism will have the chance to accept Christ. Do you accept some recent experiences of some people who've been clinically dead? They've entered heaven and some have seen Christ and their family. I do accept that people have near-death experiences. And I've read some of the books that have been written about this. There are similar examples in the Orthodox tradition. The story about the toll houses that comes in the life of St. Basil the New, he exactly had a near-death experience. He was shown the toll houses, and then he was sent back to earth. So I do accept that this sometimes happens. I don't say that all the experiences reported are worthy of equal belief. We have to exercise the utmost sobriety here. I would also say it is important to distinguish between what people experienced and the interpretation they put on that experience. Sometimes the experience is authentic, but the interpretation can be a little doubtful. For example, when Protestants go through such an experience, they speak of meeting somebody who is gentle and accepting and reassuring. And they assume that this is Christ. In the Orthodox tradition, it seems much more likely to us that this would be their guardian angel. But Protestants who haven't been taught, some of them believe in the importance of the guardian angel, but many have not been taught about that, so they would naturally think it was Christ. Does Jesus telling the thief on the cross that he would see him the same day in heaven contradict the teaching of the toll houses? Jesus didn't actually say he would be in heaven. He said he would be in paradise. And paradise is not, I think, the same as heaven. Paradise may mean a place of waiting, a place of peace, but it's not the full glory of heaven. If you look at frescoes of the Last Judgment, paradise is a garden outside heaven. The gate of heaven is beyond paradise. The good thief made an act of repentance and an act of faith so complete that perhaps he didn't need to pass through the toll houses. But we mustn't assume that applies to all of us. <laughs> If we were 
you'll be married in the next life, then what will happen to people who are divorced? <laughs> and another question, in the event of a death of a spouse, would a remarriage be acceptable? The church teaches that you are allowed to remarry after the death of your spouse. That is not a sin. Though the church has always taught that the more excellent way is to have only one marriage. We are allowed again to lay people to remarry after divorce with the church's blessing. This was a situation Christ deals with in the parable where he says there's no marriage or giving in marriage. Personal relationships will be quite different in heaven. And there will be room for all the diversity of our relationships in earth. They will be transfigured. What will be the fate of young children and babies that die before baptism? Especially miscarriages and aborted births. The Roman Catholic Church teaches that they will be in limbo, which is a place between heaven and hell, a kind of intermediate area. The Orthodox Church has never spoken about limbo. There is no authority for limbo in Holy Scripture or in the ancient tradition. What we have to say is, in their innocence, they are surely accepted by the love of God. And we commend them to that love which is far greater than anything we can ever imagine. Now, let's have a little break and you can stretch and jump up and down. And then, uh, perhaps in about five or ten minutes, I will give my final talk. And I'll try and be brief.